hit record. All right, I'm now going to introduce our friends and get this party started. Um, all right, so we have on us, oh my gosh, I just, I just almost made a terrible error here. All right, so we have with us tonight, Jennifer Nogen from Mountain Meat Shares. Uh, and she helps run the family farm, Rusty Nail Farm in Arley. And through her company, Mountain Meat Shares, she provides the Missoula and Arley communities with locally sourced meat, including pasture raised chicken, beef and pork. And Dave Owen and Jim Barngrover are co-founders of Timeless Seeds based in Elm, Montana, Mon America's only gourmet line of heirloom organic lentils and specialty grains. Dave is CEO and Jim manages grower contracting and crop procurement. So you guys are just gonna start us off. Um, we thought we'd have you just share a little bit about your experiences in 2020, in what way, if any, uh, it impacted either your your particular business or that of the folks that you work with or sell to, and uh, what in what ways, if any, that is shifting your planning for 2021 and beyond. Jen, do you, would you like to start? Sure. Um, thank you, Robin, for inviting me. I mentioned earlier, um, it's a little bit intimidating to share the stage with legends from Timeless Seeds who've been around for so long and have such established businesses. So um, I'm humbled and well, I'm really excited to be here. Um, Robin gave the description of my business. I started in the fall of 2017 and um, it has been uh, a culmination of bringing together my passion for farming and food and trying to encourage um, local people to be able to choose local meat in an easier way than just wondering where their food came from when they went to the grocery store and trying to make the connection between the ranchers and the farmers and the, the customers. So um, we've had really steady growth until uh, this March when COVID happened. Um, my main limitation um, at that time was uh, the amount of space I had on my mobile delivery vehicle. Um, how my model works is I source whole animals from local farmers and ranchers. I store the meat in a meat depot here at my farm. I put together a selection of pork, chicken, and beef, beef a very small share for my customers, and meet them. It's all frozen. I meet them once a, a month in Missoula, and um, they pick up their shares, and it's on a subscription basis. And um, the main items are pork, chicken, and beef, and they can add on things like goat, lamb, fish, and um, soon bison. And so um, the main limitation on the size of my growth was my delivery vehicle. Um, when COVID happened in March, the demand for my product grew a lot. And so I applied for a mini GTA grant and was able to expand to a small trailer to hold my freezer. So I was able to expand a little bit with that um, fast grant, which was great. Um, I had continued growth through the summer and I applied for an innovation grant this spring and built a um, walk-in freezer here at our farm, which was um, quite a birth to have. Um, it was a really big project, a big construction project. We do a lot of random projects here at the farm, but we had never done things with commercial refrigeration. So that was interesting. Um, but it allowed me to expand a lot. It allowed me to take them, some pressure off of my um, producers and be able to take on inventory earlier. Um, uh, right now, the biggest hurdle continues to be the backlog at the meat processing facilities. And so I am particularly interested to talk to anyone else in this organization and beyond who has already working on this issue. I know there are many people have been either in Western Montana or the state in general. Um, because it is uh, a really, it's always been a problem and now it's a very big problem for my ranchers and my producers and for my business. So um, I'm looking to continue to expand in 2021. Um, I think I've worked out the kinks of the walk-in freezer and um, maybe add an, an additional route uh, to deal with the limitations of my, my freezer trailer. And um, 
excited to hear any questions that you might have. Excellent, thank you. I, well, I, have, I, have, a question. I have a question. I have a question. S say more a little bit, Jennifer, about your how you found your customers and how many you have and how that all is working. Yeah, so I have about um, how I found the customers. I, I have a, a lot of experience in a lot of other areas, but not in marketing. And so uh, marketing was the biggest challenge. Started out just um, sending out emails to friends and neighbors, and it sort of grew from there. I did a lot of tabling at events. I've been to the Aero Convention a couple of times and um, went to farmers markets, uh, went to um, just about any place that would have me to explain. I think it's a bit of a niche product. A meat CSA concept is not something that people were familiar with. So it wasn't something that they knew to ask for. I think that was one of my biggest challenges um, in the beginning. Uh, and it sort of grew word of mouth. I did do traditional, well, not traditional anymore, but uh, marketing through social media, um, the website, um, grow my mailing list quite a bit. I think that helped over time. Um, I have about 110 regular subscribers on a monthly basis. I do offer a one-time pickup where people can get, say, six months of meat all at once. Um, I have maybe 10 or 15 of those types of customers. I did change my business model, not related to, to COVID at all. It used to be a six-month subscription where every six months I was looking for new subscribers and asking my existing subscribers if they wanted to renew. I had already planned to stop doing that this spring, where now once you're in, you give it a try for three months and then you're in until you tell me you're not. And that has taken a big um, burden off of me to continuously feel like I have to do marketing um, and um, I don't have to badger my loyal customers. And um, so, yeah, that's how I did marketing. Um, I, I have invested a lot of energy into learning marketing from anyone I could. Can I actually jump in with a question here too? Please. Um, I'm curious on the flip side, actually, how you found um, the producers. And, and I'm particularly curious if they were folks who had direct marketed their meat before, or if you had anybody who had had sort of only sent stuff to the auction and this was their first time doing direct marketing. Yeah, no, um, they were small producers to start with. So my beef producer um, was already only doing direct. So either to the retail um, stores here in the Missoula area or selling quarters and halves and that kind of a thing. Um, he also has a small on-farm store. So um, he was always going to be a non-commodity market um, grower. Uh, my pork producer was also, I don't think she was sending anything to the large market, but she really struggled with marketing and the ups and downs of her litters. And, you know, when pigs are ready, they're ready. And, um, you know, marketing was not in her um, playbook either. So um, she was doing um, a little bit to stores and then a little bit here and there of uh, one-offs to individuals. My chicken producers um, did almost everything through the wholesale market. So either to the grocery stores or to restaurants, they were new. And in fact, the um, development of the poultry processing facility in Hamilton that the, grow the owners of Living River Farms, Bo and Chris helped found was really inspiring to me. And one of the reasons I started this business altogether because I have grown uh, broiler chickens for 20 years and know how difficult of a business that is. And so when they started this and I knew that this was the first time we could have pasture raised poultry grown in Montana and processed in Montana, I really wanted to be a part of getting that out to the consumer. So um, uh, was really when you asked about um, how, how I chose them, I was really looking for growers that were doing as regenerative as possible and growing their animals on pasture. Question, Jennifer. Have, have you found that uh, the demand has plateaued or decreased, you know, compared to March, April, May, or has it been steady or increasing? Um, it's a little hard to uh, say. Uh, 
I've had to, um, to, to stop taking new orders because of the um, meat processing backlogs. So while now that I have this lovely walk-in freezer, I can take in more inventory and my producers for the most part could supply me with more inventory, we can't get it processed. And so um, I have sort of tabled taking on new orders. I, I am sort of taking a, a, a waiting list. Um, I would say that the demand is still there and that if I was to put the marketing um, feelers out there, I could fill more orders. And I intend to do that starting in um, February and March. I'm gonna um, expand to another producer and try to eke through this meat processing problem we've got and, and take on more people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kate, you look like you had a question earlier. Do you, do you still have it? Actually, I, I, most of my question got answered. So this might be a little bit out of the box and we don't have to go here, but I'm curious if you see down the road powers fighting against you and, and, and getting in the way of your business. Um, I'm just watching from a distance, I am not at all involved in, in uh, the mid scale meat processing efforts, except to really care about it and to watch it. Um, so maybe Jamie might have something more to say, but I'm just curious at what point is there, is there gonna be pushback that might challenge these small businesses? Do you mean um, um, governmental pushback or market forces of demand? I mean, underhanded, bizarre things from grocery stores. For example, there was someone who was giving <laughs> tastes out at a grocery store and got shut down. Basically, the store threatened not to carry their meat products anymore because the distributor of the meat was dropping off and saw them giving tastes and said, if you let that local provider give tastes out at your grocery store, we're not going to fill your grocery shelves anymore. So it's that... I, I, it's almost conspiracy theory stuff and I don't want to go there, but there is this point. I'm just curious if that's part of the conversation. Sorry if that's a super naive question. It is articulated in a super naive way. Um, but I don't, I don't have any experience with that. So I was just curious if that's even a factor for you. I hadn't thought, of, I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, in terms of like, health department licensing type things. I feel like I've crossed all my T's and dotted my I's in terms of people pushing back against that. Um, you know, I really wanna stay true to the connection between the ranchers that I know well and the customers that I know well, so that you're not expanding. I, I mean, to be honest, I don't know that this business is really scalable. It's, it's not terribly efficient when it comes to transportation in Western Montana. Um, I'm hoping to give a voice and a market to these ranchers and then maybe someday be replaced by some of the distribution that I learned about in, um, in uh, one of Jamie's sessions earlier this week with a speaker from the Midwest with a, a co-op where all of the growers can get their products to market in an equitable way. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, Kate. That was a perfect response. I'll take the opportunity to jump in here and I'm sorry, I have not been, I wasn't here for the beginning of the, the session. Um, and I just wanted to make sure Jennifer that you knew that we will have a session next week that has grown out of the Montana Food Providers Project and that's um, Resilient Meat Processing. And it's kind of reaching the end of what MOA can do for it. But um, we had Rebecca Thistlethwaite with the Niche Meat Processors Group and Tommy Bass out of MSU is, and Becky Weed are looking at starting a chapter similar to that in Montana. So um, that meeting is next um, Tuesday, December 8th at 10 a.m. And just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send you uh, a, a link to that. Thank you. I, I, I'm very much looking forward to connecting with other people on what work has already been done here. Um, I've been in, really excited about the idea of doing some mobile meat um, processing, but don't know about the economics of that, so. Yeah, and, um, 
I, you know, I, I appreciate your comment about lack of efficiencies because I think that's kind of been the theme for today in a way. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's those baby steps that move you towards efficiencies that make sense. So thank you. Yeah. I'd like to respond to this question as well you know, on, a, um, on a different scale on the, you know, um, on a on the national scale, if you will, or kind of super regional scale, um, that is very much a challenge for small niche products uh, because, you know, the larger distributors and national distributors and so forth, uh, I mean, they own the space in the stores and have a lot of influence. And uh, the fact is that uh, the largest natural food distributor in the US, uh, UNFI, uh, had a, um, an agreement, a contract with Whole Foods, the largest natural food chain in America. And UNFI basically owned the, what they call the center of the store. You know, not the, the dairy, but, but the package goes forth. And, um, and basically UNFI made the call on what products would, it, would appear in Whole Foods and would not appear in Whole Foods. Foods um, and so forth. So, and there is, you know, there is very stiff competition uh, among the distributors, the, the more local or regional distributors versus the national scale. And then, you know, especially those. And then he just left. Okay. I was, <laughs> I was trying to invite him to take his video off. Um, yeah. He's, Something. he's out there where he doesn't have broadband. It's um, very marginal, just three miles out of um, Conrad. Wow. Yeah. I heard we're 50th in the nation to this evening in terms of broadband uh, service. Um, oh. that's, that's where we're at in a lot of rural Montana. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Um, while he was here for a second, uh, well, it, you want to add to that, Jim, or just move it into you know the topic area you think is related to um well i'm not certain i have I, I recognize there's a lot of a lot of turf out there that is monopolized by the likes of unfi and uh shelf space and slotting and and that's not the conversation i think we're going to have this evening but um i guess from timeless's perspective um, I'm hoping David can reestablish himself. And, I'm back uh, on. I, I'm back on him. I just disappeared. I, I just disappeared, and uh, I just disappeared through the camera. So, if you can hear me, I'm back on. Yes. And well, maybe that'll and, and and maybe that'll help. Plus, you don't have to look at me, so that's all good. <laughs> uh well, um, I, I'm going to probably keep my comments very brief because I'm not really involved in marketing so much with Timeless Seeds. I work with the growers and have been for a number of years. And um, we worked with approximately three to four dozen growers this last year um, throughout Montana and the High Line and Central Montana. Um, and we experienced an incredible productive lentil year, which has created good problems. We've got surplus of lentils and trying to sell them in the era of COVID, especially with disrupted markets, um, has become a major challenge for timeless seeds. Um, there's good things about it. Uh, we had the best sales we've ever had in the spring and early summer. And then we had virtually almost no sales during the latter part of the summer. And our market has shifted quite a lot. It hasn't, hasn't resumed uh, to natural. And I, I would defer to David to talk about that just a little more. But before I do, um, uh, I would say that, you know, having traveled the back roads of, of the prairies of Montana this last year, and previous years and visiting with growers and growing a, a base 
of producers, of organic producers that are growing lentils in particular and other, other crops for timeless seeds. Um, it's been uh, a very rewarding time for me um, professionally um, and a, a continuation of 40 plus years uh, organic uh, agricultural based um, uh, career. And I saw the best of times and I saw the worst of times this year. Um, by and large, as I mentioned, we have record production. But I also saw the worst grasshopper infestation I've ever seen. Um, and other things that, that stacked up on several growers that just really devastated them. And it's really hard to see that happen. They hopefully will survive. I can't say that with certainty. Some of them are big operators. We've worked with big operators, medium size, and a few smaller operators. And um, I just have a lot of emotional investment in that. Uh, John Brown was with me on one of my forays. And um, I think that, that he also feels a kindred spirit to a lot of those people we visited. And um, it was a, a moving experience for him. But I think with that, uh, unless there's specific questions that I can help answer, I'd defer again to David and talk, talk about marketing because he's much better positioned to, to elaborate on that. Um, I have a question, Jim. I'm just curious, what are some of the stacked uh, issues that you, you witnessed on some of these farms that, um, that may be impacting their yeah. sustainability? In, in a lot of ways, I would say they're, they're virtually all climate related. Um, the grasshoppers, for instance, uh, the perfect storm of rains that, uh, in the late spring, early summer, really proliferated grasshoppers. And then um, a warm uh, latter part of July before the crop was uh, mature. Um, also crusting um, after seeding that was uh, really inhibited uh, the emergence. We saw corn worm uh, borers in that devoured chickpea seeds that we've never seen before in this climate. They're more typical Midwest. Um, and they were, they were central Montana this year for one grower. And wind events that blew away 350 acres of um, black beluga lentils. Um, those, those and, and another wind event uh, that hit us on a much smaller scale in the Bitterroot Valley on a experimental crop. That, um, that basically shattered it out on the ground before it could be harvested. So those are, you know, those are the things that, that I observed that, that um, people were having to, to live through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Year of disruption. Can you tell us a little bit about what the market forces that are causing the challenges now um, in terms of the selling in this latter part of David, do you want to take that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if I can, I can stay online here, happy to do that. Um, yeah, so just uh, a bit of context, I guess. Um, you know, the title of this, the title of this, um, is, uh, you know, niche marketing. And the fact is that after 30 years, that may well be a niche uh, or a, uh, a misnomer for timeless, right? So for context, uh, we sell to uh, um, nearly 20 natural food distributors around the country and our probably in you know, 500 stores in, on our reach line. Uh, we sell the food manufacturers, Patagonia provisions, occasionally the Eden Foods, um, you know, sell to some, uh, some group packagers. So, I mean, we do millions of eat. You know, my bill uh, has to do with our product. It's because we have some product that nobody else 
you know, that nobody else has, which is kind of our our little um, our own in the marketplace. We do what other people don't do, you know, to some degree. Um, and we also export to uh, uh, what is it? Three three other continents, I guess: South America, Asia, uh, and um, Europe to some small degree to Europe. So. Um, You know, in contrast to uh, to Jennifer, uh, we're juggling a number of balls on the on the um, you know on the marketing side. Uh, and our experience was that well, actually, I should I, I should give a little bit of a context uh, for what's coming next too, because I uh, we really we really have not really been very marketers, you know, per se, you know, and have not really you know kind of invested in. You know, too much in you know in the staff and the expertise to do that. Uh, previously, um, most of our customers came from uh, uh, word of mouth or or to some extent a word of book. Thank you, Liz Carlisle. Uh, <laughs> but primarily, you know, going to uh, national and 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 international trade shows. Okay, so we have uh, we have a lot of you know uh, a lot of customers, a very diverse customer base. We have a diverse, uh, in addition to the diverse grower base, uh, we have you know a somewhat diverse product line and and packaging format, um, and you know all of those were impacted um, in different ways once COVID hit. But um, as a pretext that I was on an airplane to uh, Natural Food Expo West in the first week in March, when I changed planes in Denver. I got a text that Expo West had been canceled because of COVID, right? And I, I, I was literally on the plane to Anaheim and had to decide in, in Denver if I thought I could catch a flight back to Montana, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, or I, you know, or I just go to Anaheim. So I went to Anaheim. Okay, so that was, uh, uh, that was canceled. Uh, but anyway, I, I worked out of a hotel. I visited a distributor. I did, I did some work down there anyway, because a few days later, uh, there was uh, a natural food trade show that we'd never been to in New York City called the Healthy Food Expo. And uh, as it turns out, that was in the Javits Center. It was also the last trade show allowed in New York City. And uh, 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 about from what I heard from uh, from, from attendees, Attended down by you know, a th you know uh, De Blasio basically shut down in New York City. Oh, um, so COVID, you know, experience kind of um, okay. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, um, I, I guess. What I can say, maybe in David's behalf, uh, if I may, uh, that that trade show actually was very successful in terms of of interest of major restaurant providers in New York City, um, and they they were wanting to work with us, but when things shut down, that virtually nothing came of that show to date. It may pick up, we may be able to pick up some of those pieces. It was the most promising trade show David had ever gone to. And he may be back with us and I don't know if he can hear us. Yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, 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 back for a minute. So, and and Jim is totally correct. It's like, you know what? It did not, it did not, you know, feel right and, and would not be wise to follow up on, we, we had like 200 leads from that trade show. Virtually all of them were restaurants. And, um, and of course, once the restaurants were shut down, you know, that's uh, when you make the call to say, do you want our product? You make the call and say, geez, I hope you're all right. You know, are you going to make quest, it? Um, question, David. Um, that I, <laughs> question, David. Were those um, chain restaurants or individual restaurants, local, you know, uh, what was no, the scale of those? You know, most of them, 
uh, most of them were were local restaurants, you know. And, and I forget there's I, I think there's what is it? Is it ten thousand restaurants or hundred thousand restaurants or whatever it is in you know in New York City and the and the what they call the tri-state area there. Um, uh, they were, you know, they were mostly, you know, kind of farm to table, you know, kind of restaurants. They weren't, you know, they weren't big national chains by any means, you know, although we did some customers, uh, not from that show, but, but, but previous to that, um, I mean, one of our, I mean, one of our customers, Blue Apron, as an example, the, you know, uh, the, the, the food kit company, and we have, we have other big customers who are what they call fast, casual, healthy food restaurant customers. Um, and, you know, COVID, you know, has has significantly impacted those customers. Uh, customers to our, basically to our to, to our restaurant channel, um, they're probably down, you know, close to 75%, or at least we're in, you know, March and April. And, uh, or, you know, surprisingly, actually, starting back a little bit, you know, in the last month or two. But, but as much as we lost on retail or on the restaurant side, uh, we gained on the on the retail side, you know. And we went from we went from two people in our retail packaging room uh, to five people, and and really weren't keeping up, right? I mean, usually, usually our turnaround is you know is like at one point we were probably out you know three to four weeks. That's as far as filling the orders, because our existing um, our existing distributors, uh, you know, they, they place some of them place more orders in the month of March than they had placed the entire previous year. You know, so it was kind of uh, it, was, it was a bit of a uh, you know a, a dichotomy, and what we lost on the retail or our restaurant side uh, was really. You know, kind of pretty made made up on the rest on the on the retail side, but of course, as everybody you know, probably knows, is that there was this huge panic buy in grocery stores where you know the shelves were empty, so the distributors were panicking. So that caused us to panic. You know, to you know to, to scramble to meet their needs. Uh, we were actually you know uh, quite successful at doing it, actually, and we actually kept a distributor just because of the fact that we figured out the capacity or you know figured out how to meet meet their needs and um you know uh, uh, that's it was good uh, part of what helped us do that was that uh um we work with uh, montana mac extension center at msu who advises manufacturers and they helped us you know basically increase it so that we could uh, you know better meet that demand uh what we have seen though, you know, in the past three or four months, which I think Jim, you know, maybe alluded to this, the fact that all that panic buying was, um, you know, that, that created a huge inventory, you know, in, in the in-home pantries, you know, and some in the grocery stores as well. So, uh, you know, orders have dropped off, I mean, dramatically, um, over the past two or three months, you know, what, what, what we're understanding as, as, as basically, you know, uh, the aftermath of the COVID um, panic buy, um, you know, it's not, it's not down to zero, you know, but, but, but uh, we had to wrap up, you know, we were running double shifts, we we're just barely keeping up, even on the bulk side, you know, and, and uh, what we hear now and what we we're experiencing ourselves and what we hear now from some of the repackagers that we sell raw product to, and you know, they agenda their own brand. You know, uh, as an example, I mean, Arrowhead Mills. You know, it's a long, it's a, a brand with a long history and 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 high visibility. Um, some of their packages had our lentils in them, right? But but over the uh, not packaged by us, but packaged by by one of our customers. Um, and, and and that repackaging customer and, and one other that we have that has their own brand, you know, has told us past two or three months, they, they, they've even, they'd even, you know, pre-ordered and, uh, and they had to back out basically on their, on their contracts. They said, you know, 
something happened, something died here in the last, you know, over the last weeks. We're not sure where this market is going. I um, mean, I think a lot of it was just was just the fact that, you know, people bought 10 years of levels just because mm -hmm. there happened to be none on the shelf, you know, the week before. So anyway, uh, we have to we have to kind of survive through that, uh, you know, through that backlog. That'd be about will. seven or eight uh, pounds, wouldn't it, David? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the average consumption of levels, and I, I hope it's not the average consumption of levels on, on the screen that I'm looking at. <laughs> the average consumption of levels in the U.S. Is, uh, uh, is, is between eight and 10 ounces per year per capita, right? So uh, so a one pound bag sitting on the shelf, as you may have seen, uh, you know, on the average, that's two years, that, that, that's two years lentil supply for somebody in, uh, you know, in America. Um, India, of course, is you know, like four or five times or 10 times higher than that. But, but in any case, um, 33 just, you know, pounds I saw around. recently, David, 33 pounds. Every well, per person in India. Is that right? Okay, well, yeah, well, uh, there you go. See, our, our, our market is not in Montana, our market is in India. It's just, it's, uh, Meanwhile, I have to break it. Can I break in just for a second? Because there was a horrifying story on NPR. I only caught part of it, but it was talking about in India, there's some policy. And this guy basically stated flat out, we have too many producers in India. We need fewer. And to, and I was just like, I was ready to get sick to my stomach and I'd miss the rest of the story, but it, I want to go back and listen to that. Well, well you know, and that's, that's what, uh, that's what Earl Butt said during the Nixon administration, you know, back in the late 60s and 70s, like get bigger, get out. You know, we have too many farmers, you know, we just need for bigger farmers. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's an old mantra, actually. And of course, you know, part of our mission at Timeless is, I mean, it's just the opposite. You know, it's like, oh, we need, we need more farmers. We need more organic farmers. We need farmers to make a living on smaller acres. So as, as Wes Jackson says, we, we need more eyes per acre. The problem with agriculture is we have too few eyes per acre, right? So um, part of our mission is to get more eyes per acre, get more feet on the ground. Um, you know, in response, in, response to that, in response to your earlier question about the demand in Dude, I see it plateau. I think that for me, um, and I'm being cautiously optimistic, one of the, there, there isn't any more panic buying, so to speak, but the, just the visibility of my service and my product has been the benefit of this COVID time is maybe a few more eyeballs on their screens to see my marketing, maybe the visibility of the meat shortage, whether there was one or not, um, just the more people cooking at home. Um, we're going into the winter season, so yeah. less people traveling, you know, Missoula, Missoulians travel a lot, and so they were going to be home, you know, cooking at home. So all of those things, um, I think, just lent themselves to a little bit more visibility to something that people didn't even know existed, and then that word of mouth kind of grew on that word of mouth, and so I'm cautiously optimistic that this little bump will continue and that it won't fall back down. Even yeah. when we can go to restaurants again and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that's right. And our you know our our web orders, we've got a, a shopping cart on our website that has really just been I mean, just kind of thought. And the only reason we really put it there was because people just kept calling us up and saying, "Geez, I can't buy your product." And you know, in Omaha, can I order from you? You know, I was like, "Well, okay, well, what's your credit card?" And it just was not not very efficient way, you know, to serve. Uh, uh, individual consumers, you know, a, a, a business to consumer uh, kind of model. Uh, but we saw in uh, March and April, each of the months, we sold more products uh, through our website than we had, you know, the entire previous year, right? And that is, uh, that is maintained, you know, that, that's also backed off, you know, quite a bit in the past couple of months, uh, but we're still at, you know, same month sales on the internet, uh, 2019 versus, uh, versus uh, 2020. Uh, but, you know, the reality is, and, you know, and the, the things that I read in the, you know, in the food press pretty much is that uh, 
people have discovered that you know that ordering online, getting getting quick delivered, you know, from grocery stores to their house, whatever that that uh, that is not going to go away, and that's probably you know only going to increase. So uh, you know we've we've actually invested um, with a um, um, with a um, contract, if you will, in uh, a marketing contract in Helena, whose whose sole focus is um, you know building internet sales. You know that's something that I mean we really don't understand internally. We've had a we've had a shopping cart on our website for maybe ten or fifteen years, but it's always just been an afterthought and almost almost a news to fill those orders. Uh, but we did discover, you know, from COVID, it's like wow. I mean, there are a lot of people who who will order online, you know, who can't get our product, who want our product for, you know, uh, for whatever reason, and um, and want us to ship to them. It's it has not been our it's not been our at all. Um, you know, previous, previously, but we're going to put more, you know, more energy, more effort, you know, and we're definitely putting money into um, online marketing. So what's going to happen in the future? You know, we don't know. Um, um, I think, you know, given the fact that the vaccine, um, you know, supposedly it's going to have, you know, pretty wide distribution by the middle of the year. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very, very confident that, that some of our larger, uh, you know, fast, fast casual food restaurants, act, you know, for sure. Uh, there was a, a news release from the National Restaurant Association here a couple of months ago, and they're basically the trader organization for uh you know for restaurants of all of all sizes across the u.s but uh they were saying that there already has over a hundred thousand restaurants currently closed america right that's uh that's significant even if 99.9 percent of them are not our customers it's an indication that you know, uh, a lot of restaurants just might not just might not make One take it. Away. I was going to say, <laughs> huh? You might I'm not going to make it. Might, One takeaway might, might not make it. Yeah. Yeah. One takeaway I'm getting from both of your conversations is that uh, the the stronger market that folks are leaning into is the direct to consumer market um and i'm seeing, you know, curious about that being for both of you if at this point um and the answer might be both but i'm curious if you um you know both jen and the timeless folks if at this point you would prefer these kind of like um individual customers um, so what Dave was just talking about, about investing in, in marketing that would reach people who would make these individual orders, or are you at the scale now, or, or would it be more helpful now to have a sort of an aggregator in there? Um, you know, I don't know exactly who that might be for you, Jen, or, or even if it's like a physical aggregator versus even just like a, a marketing aggregator, you know what I mean? If you were sort of like part of uh, a, a wide scale newsletter that reaches groups of people that shop at the good food store or something like that. Or for Timeless, I'm thinking about like, um, you know, we subscribe to a grocery delivery service here in the Bay Area. Um, you know, would it be better for Timeless if a bunch of individual people in the Bay Area were ordering lentils? Cause you'd probably get more of that dollar. Or, um, you know, if you were on the website, you know, for good eggs, you'd get less of that dollar, but you'd only have to send the one truck, you know? I mean, you should have you should have listened in on the the uh, yeah, uh, discussion the other, other night. Question. The other but, night, you know, I, I was going to say the the other night on the arrow, whichever one it was. I'm so confused this week, but people up in the Flathead the growers are basically happy to not be at the farmers market. A couple of them doubled their direct customers. 
So this whole aggregator question really is up, right? People were, their lives, their lives were much less stressed. They had weekends um, and they managed to make it work because in a couple of cases, they doubled their CSA people. So if the, <laughs> if, the, yeah. if the really experienced market growers are actually saying, you know, if we don't have to go to another farmer's market, we're happy. And yet a lot of us who believe in the local food system think the farmer's market is the center of it. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't know what that's about. Sorry, sorry. I think anyway, that's, that's I'll leave that question on the table and, and mute. <laughs> and I can second that for here because JC and Matt haven't been going to the farmer's market in this neck of the woods either. It's most of the smaller um, producers. One of our other large, our second large producer does still go to the market and find it highly useful. So it is, it is partly personality and how a business is set up. And I think the farmer's market can be a great introduction for growers to get their product out there when they're first trying out some things to see what the people have to say about it or get the word out or try out some things. But I think once they've grown, at least the uh, farm that Max was mentioning um, is our local grower here in our Lee Harlequin Produce, you know, they were a major um, presence at the farmer's market, but wow, what an amazing amount of work it was to get there and, and to go and to try to guess what people were going to buy. And for them who already had the infrastructure to do CSA, um, the software and the delivery routes and the processes and the growing capability to just increase CSA and not go to farmer's market was a major, it was easy for them. And they were the ones saying, we never, we need to go to farmer's market again. But for other much smaller growers who are just dipping their toe in the market, the farmer's market might be the, the easy way in and, and a loss of that market would be difficult. For me to answer Liz's question, you know, I'm all direct to consumer. Um, that's that's my, my whole, um, vision for this particular business. But in terms of the marketing, yes, in as many ways as that I can be um, shared and for me to share. And I'm just starting to get to the size and the network now to be able to do that with my fellow farm and food people where that, that makes a big difference to be able to say to my um, my my bone broth provider or my my vegetable person hey put something in your newsletter about me and i'll do the same for you because we're talking to the similarly minded um, audiences for sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and i i guess there's one glaring thing that's looking at me at timeless we have seven million pounds of lentils out on the farm um, yes, we want to put as many of them as possible in one pound packages and 10 pound bags, maybe 25 and 50 pound bags, but that is not probably going to work for most of our growers. They're going to be holding the bag. That's not acceptable. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it's, we built a business on what we projected with markets as we knew them. We're, we're in a, a new world now in, in many ways. And it probably has many opportunities, but also so many challenges. And we got to figure it out. Um, it, well, it, as, as, as all of this shifts, it's really fascinating. I love listening to you all here. Uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, everybody's or most people have a bumper sticker that says, you know, know your farmer. <laughs> and that, that is, you know, a lot based on uh, farmer's markets. And, and if, if the farmers disappear from the contact with their customer, that could have some really challenging unintended consequences. And so I'm wondering, now like Jim um, mentioned that I was tagged along with them for 
several days along the High Line visiting all of these organic farms in, well, what was it, June? Uh, and it was beautiful, beautiful. It was an experience that was just a really rich one for me and being able to go all the way across the High Line. And most of the land that I walked on was organic and it was, it felt so good, you know, going from Haver to Glasgow and further. Um, and, and, and it was good for me in several ways just to have my, be touching th that soil. But the other thing was to be in communication with the growers because as a, you know, early in the seventies organic grower and how tenuous it was then and, and seeing that same challenge here and, and just connecting with these people who are, who are doing, you know, the work that needs to be done, uh, and and if you know, I don't know if there's a a, a way to uh, communicate my enthusiasm for being on that trip and being in connection with with the people growing the the stuff that's timeless cells and hearing the stories of the corn borers that have jumped ship and gone into uh, chickpeas and the uh, coming grasshopper concern and uh, all, those, all those things. And then seeing crops that were just looking so good. Uh, I mean, it was a really a, 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 a highlight of my life, whether there whether it was a COVID year or not. Um, and I don't know how to use that enthusiasm that I have and the experience of, uh, of that trip to any benefit, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it, it's one thing to be uh, really focused on how to market and um, all of those logistics. I mean, we still need to keep the eye on the ball of the importance of the consumers and the producers sure. having connection. And, and John, what you I'm said not... made me really think about the importance of telling that story to people in a way they can hear it, sharing that experience, because not everybody's gonna be able to go walk the land on the high, on the high line. So whether you get one of these really talented podcast folks on YPR or NPR to interview you about that, or it's it's telling these stories in ways people can hear them, it's more than just telling the story. It's getting it where it needs to be heard. Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent point, um, Kate. And, uh, you know, as you were talking, John, I mean, what went through my head is like, I mean, what a, what, what a marvelous colonial, you know? We need to we need to videotape John Brown, uh, you know, tell his you know his uh, his his perspective on on what he saw and and what he felt. Uh, we have in the last year approximately um, hired a person who works for us um, part time as a social media, um, you know, on Facebook and and um, and Instagram. Uh, she used to be uh, the wife of the farmhand of one of our farmers, actually up in Haver, has since moved back to uh, Florida to be with her parents. But anyway, a marvelous post. And one of the things that they're doing is uh, what she calls a Friday farmer feature, where she does, uh, you know, basically profiles, interviews of farmers, and and that is without a doubt her most popular post, you know, on on Facebook. You know for sure so people are you know uh, people are eager for those stories and people want to know um, you know about the farms and about the farmers and I mean most of them have very compelling stories you know that the reasons they they're organic farming you know uh, most of them are a lot of them are kids that move back to the family farm and sort of relative relative kids five you know 50 years and younger Kind of stories, but you know, um, and you know, couldn't make it farming conventionally. Other ones, mm -hmm. 
um, you know, have made the switch because of some health issue that they personally or or someone in their in their family has experienced. You know, and I think, I mean, those kinds of stories are, I mean, they are so authentic, and and, and they resonate so much. You know, with people, and I'm I'm assuming, you know, primarily in the urban areas, who they, you know, have lost that connection to real people on the land growing real food. So I do think that's one of the opportunities is there yeah. to build that build that yeah. rapport. Yeah. Just on that on that topic, uh, if I had understood the impact I was the, the lentil underground tour was going to have on me. I would have rented a bus and brought everybody I could from the Flathead to tend that thing. I, I had no idea. You know, I just, seriously, I went because Patty said go. So that's what I do. I do whatever Patty tells me to do. Um, but I, 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 I just so wish I had understood um, because now all I do is talk about it and say, we have to do this. And, you know, it, anyways, it's incredibly impactful for shifting people's consciousness so powerful and, and i as, as fabulous as the friday farmers feature is and i'm going to look it up there is something you know i we all know this but this is what i think john is saying the the power of that was literally walking the land um yeah. for two days yeah you just i don't know how you bottle that yeah you know, but you know, another, uh, yeah. another, another angle on this, I mean, after watching, um, you know, uh, Provenza earlier and, and he just, I mean, in the middle of this COVID situation there, you know, we all know about the bigger, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go a little bit out of the, a little bit off script here, but so many of our issues are related to the, you know, the paradigm of the big pharmaceuticals, big ag, top-down elites. You know, uh, is it Fred? You know, he talked about in the academic world how they were slow to come to some of the insights they have now. They did. They didn't think about it that way 30, 40 years ago. A lot of those certainties are crumbling. But the political divisiveness is lining up on kind of left right when actually there's a lot of common interest, but the left is sort of clueless that they are defending the, this broken paradigm of the pharmaceutical companies and all these people making money off crisis, making money off selling you supplements, making money off getting you sick and then selling you the drugs to make you healthy when we know now that food is medicine and medicine is food. And somehow if that became, if that could break into the mainstream noise somehow, sales of all of this stuff we're talking about would be off the charts because people would finally get it. And there'd be a whole new careers in helping people learn how to cook it and how to, to find it. And, and I don't, you know, you know, permaculture says, where's the leverage point to get in there with the least amount of energy for the most amount of impact. I'm waiting for somebody to figure this one out to kind of break through this noise. It's like if America could just say, CNN, Fox News, you're fired, go away. You're making too much money to give us nothing in return. We're going to this other source and we're going to get healthy because we're going to eat right. You know, Liz, in your work, do you see any any bright lights for that starting to break through the, the consensus, you know, denial that's out there? <laughs> Um, I think uh, a lot of things are rearranging this year. I think, you know, as we heard from everybody. And so I do think there's a, I think that story is yet to be written. You know, we're about, we're about to be in a big rebuilding process, um, economies at every scale. And, and also I think communities at every scale. Um, and so I think there's a chance to continue writing that story. And I think, um, I think policy is really important. Um, and I, I'm heartened that we might see, I guess I'll just say, you know, for the first time, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe ever since local food was the only food there was, there's a really serious discussion about a secretary of agriculture at the federal level, who's a strong champion of local foods programs, um, Marsha wow. Fudge. 
and this this discussion is happening right now <laughs> on the transition team. Uh -huh. It's a, it's it seems like a 50-50 fight between kind of the ag policies of the past and potentially somebody who's basically all about just what you said, Max, connecting the health policy, the food programs, the hunger programs to the local food programs. I mean, that's that's what Marsha Fudge has done. Um, she hasn't been engaged in this conversation about how do we support commodity agriculture. Uh, so that's exciting to me. It seems like maybe we could get some significant federal support to link health and agriculture support in ways where we've only kind of seen those those little programs kind of on the edges of our food policy to help us all kind of struggle along until the next day. Yeah. Well, that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, I do just want to check in on the time. You know, we technically agreed it, the, it's scheduled till 615. I'm happy to stay on. I tell people I, I'll be here till seven. And I want I do want to create the space for people to close out if they would like to go on with their evenings. And, you know, so just just wanted to bring that point out. But I'm also finding these evening conversations just incredibly rich and helpful and appreciate them myself. Yes, thank you for this format. I was so excited when I saw that on the Arrow agenda that we were going to get to have happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> which was which came early since I'm on Pacific time. Happy hour started at 430. Yes. <laughs> for that. <laughs> And last longer than. <laughs> oh, that's great. Relative to the, uh, uh, the, the comment on the uh, new uh, Secretary of Agriculture, the um, Mark Benton and Ricardo uh, Salvador had an opinion piece, I think it was in the New York Times either yesterday or today, mm. that I would uh, uh, encourage people to look at because uh, they made a very um, cogent argument about how we need to revamp the uh, U.S. Department of Ag. Oh, excellent. Mm. Yeah, really. I just dropped it in the chat. It's really phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank awesome. you. Okay, thank great, you. thanks. Oh, my. Robin, I, I uh, am I am I on? Um, yep. You guys have done a great job putting this together, and and Moa too. I mean, it's a little bit frustrating because there's so much. And John and I were talking. Of course, if you go to a conference, you know, you drive, you're there, and now we're thinking we can sort of somehow have a conference and do something else at the same time. We're just so <laughs> restraint is not in our vocabulary as modern <laughs> humans. But um, it's very rich, and I'm glad it's being recorded. And I think there's a really challenge to get it out to more people. Because what I've learned that I didn't really understand and hearing like earlier in the week, some of the other producers and stuff talking, is I'm getting a better sense of the people involved in Montana and the, you know, who are part of this emerging local food system. I mean, it's been here for, you know, over a decade and longer, but it's getting, it's getting fleshed out in my mind better. And uh, the challenges of trying to take it mainstream in my community. I mean, Helen has got, Helen area is 60,000 people. You know, there are, there are two, at the best, there's 200 people involved in this conversation. And, you know, given all we know about social technology and social media, what's wrong with this picture? You know, how do we make this, how do we get this in, in where I'm living I want 2,000 people in this conversation. I think they're there. I think there are people in my community that care about this stuff. And I was really delighted to hear um, the, I, I had a hard time with his name, but from Flathead in the, in the Blackfoot uh, indigenous bundles and that kind of thing with the food initiative yesterday. Uh, logo. Uh, uh, logo. The, that jit, yeah, they're, that jit, there's so many bright people in, in his generation that I that we need to kind of make them more visible and, and I just don't know how to break through. People are so obsessed with, you know, even our friends on the so-called progressive side are so obsessed with hating the president and the, you know, 
caught in the CNN, Fox News eddy. And how do we get them out of that goddamn eddy and in, back into the, you know, into the whitewater where we're doing the work? And so I, I don't expect that to be answered here. I'm just saying I'm frustrated. That that's my frustration right now is, is how do we break out, you know? I, I'll shut it up. <laughs> well, I'll... I, um, I would like to add something to that because I, I think a lot of people feel as you do. And it's to that end that um, we at ERA want to really put our effort into moving the abundant Montana directory to be front and center for the state of Montana as a promotional hub of uh, locally grown food for Montanans and commit the resources. And, and we have a, we're working with a, an, a company out of Michigan that has, has done this successfully in Michigan called Taste the Local Difference. And I can put the link in the chat here in a second, but the point is to uh, commit the resources uh, and it, to develop a, a revenue-based model, but that is a dynamic model using actively engaging and committing resources to, to fund um, a connection with resources in different regions that are promoting local food in their community. So help help them with, with a common branding and a common communication and you know promotional materials and education and the DIYs and all the things that Arrow is really good at. Um, and so that they can help build strength and promote their producers and their restaurants and their purveyors and their processors and all that good stuff. And then that information gets funneled back and is presented on the overall hub. And the gift of that is that anybody just goes to that one hub and they're getting educated no matter what they're doing, you know, no matter why they come there, they're going to come away with more energy, more information, more knowledge about what's happening in the state and it, it feeds itself. And at some point it actually um, is a self generating system. So we think it's, we think it's a really good use of arrows, talents and skills and expertise but and more particularly it feels like it's the next level for helping all these pieces connect because we need we need a loud voice we need that megaphone phone to support all these efforts that are happening um anyway so that's what we're doing and we'll talk more about that tomorrow at the session on arrow 2020 and beyond Robin, that's really great to hear. I think to speak to Max's um, frustration about people kind of talking about this in this divisive way, I think the two things, in my opinion, that help that are education and emotion. And you know, you can educate people all the time about stuff and they just don't, they just sort of like it rolls off of them. But when you bring that emotion to it and they meet the farmers or meet uh, issue that speaks to their values or their frustrations directly, then you take that emotion and then put the education behind it. And then things, people get involved. I feel like, you know, if we just have data, we'd have data, we have data. And it's one of the things I'm so frustrated about in this COVID thing is like, we hear about these numbers. It's the first thing they tell us are all, all these numbers. Like I'm a numbers person that doesn't even resonate with me. But if you tell me a story about my neighbor next door and how they caught COVID or how it affected their mother or something that like the real emotions of how it affected their childcare and then they couldn't get to work or whatever it was, that is going to affect my ability to make a decision and not the data and the numbers. So I think if we can take these farmer stories, which we've been talking about, and then pair that with the, um, with the education that Arrow is talking about and have that connection, then we can get out of this just like CNN, Fox News divisiveness because it doesn't really speak to you directly the way an emotional story of your farmer next door might. That's my hope. Maybe it's optimistic. Yeah. Kate, do you want to jump in with the story website? Um, I have shifted to preparing dinner for family. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So I missed a little bit of that, but I think what Jennifer just said just nails it. The 
the story and it's telling the story and it's delivering the story and we're in an attention like people's attentions are scattered their grandmothers are dying and they're sick and somebody can't go somewhere not because they're sick but because they're on quarantine and then there's everything else like there's their businesses are going under they're homeschooling their niece because their cousin is living with them like there's crazy stuff going on right now and there is even not in covid and so trying to find, I was thinking back to um, Max's comments about Helena and 200 out of 60,000 people, why can't you talk to more people? And it's people only have so much bandwidth. And so you have to, you really have to deliver stories through the channels they go to in ways that touch them. Um, and the website Robin's referring to is one small step forward um, in that larger strategic effort to really get people to see things differently, which which comes from knowing where they are. It's relationships. And in lieu of relationships, telling a story really well, as Jennifer just said. That was a ramble. I didn't answer your question at all, Robin. That's what happens when you ask someone who's cooking to talk. <laughs> I did not know. Um... So it's just one other website that's come forward. It's come out of these food access calls. We did this start. We started this past spring, and uh, um, it's a group of folks from various organizations who are putting it together. And the idea is to gather these Montana stories and make them searchable and identifiable, so that you could um, incorporate them as you need for an article that you're writing or uh, a blog post that you're putting up or anything, this place of being able to do, being a resource to have the stories that could then be delivered, as Kate said, to the places where people go. Um, so, um, Kate and I, and I, I can add real, I can just add real quickly to what Robin said that, you know, the prototype that we're rolling out, the feedback, it, it's going to be a prototype. And this is exactly the group of people um, one of the groups of people we would want to look at that and say, is this functional and how in the next generation of this, can we make it more effective? Because there's a ton of websites out there. Western Organization of Resource Councils has a beautiful homegrown stories website, but it's not searchable. And, and it also doesn't present the stories in lots of different ways. So this tool and its ability to help people find the kinds of stories they need so quickly so they can get them to a legislator or a new city council member in their town um, there's some real hope behind that the other piece of it and i don't know if this is non relevant for right now but the idea that the communication capacity of montana's food and ag organizations like montana farmers unit uh, union is fantastic. They have a lot of power there. But a lot of these scrappier organizations, whether it's Arrow and MOA um, and others, there's only so much money put towards communication. And most, and this is going to be um, just the observation there's so many people who are oriented towards making real shit happen and move dirt that just talk is often called just talk whereas storytelling is really important and so it's a it's a fascinating thing and if this um montana food system story collaborative now montana food matters can not only create a tool of a website but also get to a point where it can enhance the capacity of our farmers and food and ag organizations to tell stories effectively the that next step of power in this i think is incredible So we're leaning in and feedback and suggestions and helping us move it forward. All welcome, always, but. Glad to hear about all that. I, I'm, I'm glad I didn't know about any of that. That's wonderful to know. Uh, well, um, yeah. I'm gonna get off. Bob Quinn's gonna wrap, be talking in a little bit. So I wanna hear what he has to say and see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks for joining Max. Um, I've been delighted to be on this call with everyone. Shall we close it out? Feel like it, are we hitting a completion point?
Okay. Uh, I'd like to close it out with this, Robin, because you started with a with a pitch for fundraising, right? And, I did, uh, didn't I? Well, today's my 71st birthday, and on Facebook, I I put a uh, a fundraiser for Arrow as a uh, birthday oh. gift to me. Okay. So, uh, uh, it's it, 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 a Lion uh, page. Anyway, please. Uh, Please share that and encourage your friends and family to. We'll do. Great job for over 40 years. Awesome. Amazing. We have, a, amazing. we have a proposal. Uh, we're going to sing happy birthday. Okay. Here we go. You lead. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday <laughs> and the best part right. is that that was oh, recorded. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, bye, everyone. Oh, all right. Okay. Fabulous Thank call. you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday.